This is Gaussian TV, broadcasting independently from Port Harcourt, South South Night. What punishments? Well, the punishment for any preacher who didn't preach the truth of the gospel, the Bible tells us his works will be burnt at the beamer seat of Christ. His works will be burnt. The Bible tells us he will suffer loss. It will look like he never did ministry. In other words, God will punish prosperity preachers. Well, the punishment for prosperity preachers is that they, 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 they defrauded and misrepresented the character of God. Now, if you are not preaching prosperity gospel, how would you fly your private jets? Well, I don't have to fly a private jet to be a man of God. The call to ministry is not a meal ticket. The call to ministry is service, is sacrifice. The Bible tells us the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Then Jesus said, if I, your master, went through this route, you have no other route to go through other than this. So a man of God is not a superstar. A man of God is a servant who is called to serve the people of God, the grace of God. So you don't have to have a private jet. And even though I have nothing against private jets, but that doesn't define ministry. The definition of ministry is the word and prayer. You know, I keep telling preachers, if prosperity was all that it is to the gospel, then God is partial. Because there are fishermen across the river who cannot afford anything like prosperity. They are just struggling to get fishes. And a pastor has to be sent there to pastor those poor people. And he has to live among them and be with them for, for life. And that pastor, because of the people around him and the community where he is, there's no way he can ever buy a jet. To even get a car could be a problem. And he will have to stay there and manage among those people to pastor them. Does God hate him? No. So there's nothing like prosperity gospel. The gospel is the message of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And sometimes in preaching it, we lose everything. And we stay where God has sent us. And we are contented with what God has made available to us where we are. And serve the purpose of God, sometimes for a lifetime. Mr. Omana, missionaries left America and came to our Africa in its own undeveloped state. They left the wealth of America. They left their homes. They left their houses. They left their wealth. They came here and stayed with us in Africa. Mosquitoes killed some of them. They died poor. Were they not successful? They were successful. So that's why you don't use material indices to define a man of God. You use service. You use the message of Christ to define a man of God. Yeah, but if you have a private jet, you are able to move to wherever you want to go in a jiffy. Yes, of course. It, it helps with comfort. It helps with convenience. But even if you don't have it, you will still find your way around. That's why Paul told Timothy, preach the word in and out of season. In and out of season means there are times you will not have any form of convenience. In fact, Brother Paul says, me, myself, Paul, I've been in shipwreck often. I've fasted often. It's not fasting and prayer, fasting for lack of food. He said, I know how to abase. I know how to abound. And he says, whatever state I find myself, I am content. That's ministry. In ministry, it will always be rosy. There are times you will be without and you are not permitted to manipulate people. You have to endure it. That's why as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, endure hardship. That's ministry. That's apostolic ministry. Not this uh, superstar kind of thing that we see all over the world. We are talking about core Bible ministry. The kind of ministry that Jesus expects us to run from the scriptures. So how do you, what do you make of the big man of God who says, I am a dangerous giver. If you cannot give the way I give, then you cannot prosper the way I have prospered. He is just trying to deceive the gullible people in his congregation and collect their, more of their money and add to himself. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. Mr. Man, I've been around. You know, I've been around. I've been in these camps. I've preached that thing. The only person that prospers from that prosperity gospel is the preacher. That's the only person. 
because everybody is giving to him. Everybody is giving to him. He's the only one that prospers. That's why that gospel is his calm. It's not the gospel of Christ. I can be honest with you and I can give you scripture upon scripture upon scripture. It's not the gospel of Christ. Okay, let's take, let's, let me take you back to this metamorphosis story. I'd like to hear from you. That very point, was it in a trance? No. Were you dreaming? No, what happened? So when I began to question the gospel that I was preaching, I started feeling no fulfillment, no satisfaction. I will preach. I'm not happy. No, the joy left. Honest. I thought my ministry had finished. I thought my days were over because there was no more zest, no motivation, no kick. So I told my wife, this is how I feel. My wife said, even how she's been questioning this gospel, let's go and pray. So we traveled and prayed. After praying, we were still looking for what is the problem. We couldn't find. We came back. We traveled again. Long story short, I stumbled on Andrew Womack's book. One of his books, just one, eight pages. And I knew what was wrong. Just eight pages. Now, I'm a theology. I did theology. And I was good with Christology. But the Christology I did in theology, I didn't know how to apply it. But that book fixed everything for me. So I came home and went back to my Bible. Sat down with my Bible and went through the scripture studying. And I, I knew what the problem was. So I came to our church and I apologized to the congregation. I said, church, I came today to humbly apologize. I've just come by a discovery from the scriptures of things I taught you that I thought was correct. But looking at the Bible again carefully, those things are not correct. If you give me the opportunity, I will make it right. I will show you, I will teach you, I will correct it. But if you feel you can't trust me anymore, you want to leave, I have nothing against you. And some people left, some remained. And then we began to teach and correct things. We began to teach and correct things. We began to teach the finished work of the cross. We began to teach about the cross of Christ and what it has done. Salvation, redemption, the righteousness of God. We began to teach all of that as the gift of God's grace. And people in our church began to grow. Began to grow. And for a while, nobody wanted to identify with me. Then after a while, it exploded. And everybody wanted me to come and preach because they thought it's a new brand of the prosperity gospel. Okay, so hold it there. When you said nobody wanted to identify with you, who are you talking about? Is it church members or your family? I'm talking about friends in ministry. Okay. Friends in ministry. Because yeah, now... I'm talking about church itself. Oh, church. All the people that remained were growing and they were all happy. They were learning and they were seeing the truth and they were excited. They were learning Christ. But friends of mine in ministry started shying away because then I started saying tithe is not New Testament. You don't have to tithe. And they felt like, no, 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 our economy will be in trouble. But then when they saw the message was gaining ground, a few of them invited me thinking now I'm combining this message with prosperity. But when I went to their churches and they had the pure gospel of Christ, some of them were fascinated. And they said, ah, this is the truth. Oh. I want to preach it. But when we started studying with some of them and they saw the implications, they said, no, 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 Dr. Damina, I don't want to preach it. You'll be preaching it. I want to stay with what I'm preaching. What is the worst experience you've had because of this? The worst experience I've had because of this message was a church I went to in London. The guy invited me to London to come and preach. And I told him, do you know what I preach? Please, I don't want trouble. He said, no, 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 no. you are a father in the Lord. Come and preach. I said, I? He said, I, I know everything you're preaching. I said, okay. So they bought me a ticket. I landed in London. I went to the church. Thousands in London. Thousands in London. For you to have 1,000. These are thousands. Let's say two, three. So that I'm not exaggerating. I came into this service, Mr. Omana, and I preached on the redemptive power of the cross. That service went gaga. The message came with people felt liberated. You can see people screaming on their seats. But when I turned in the midst of preaching, the pastor's face was, he was frowning. Ah. So I decided, let me finish. When we get to the hotel, we'll sort out what the matter is. <laughs> then I started thinking in my mind, didn't I recognize him? I took time to celebrate and appreciate him. What could I have said? That? Anyway, we'll find out. So I finished the message. The service was wild that night. As I was rounding off and I prayed, I asked the people to give and support the conference. They gave and started going. They took me to the hotel. That night, the pastor came. 
Don't you preach deliverance? I said, what I preached tonight, what was that? He said, no, no, no. No, no. Tell them they are bound. Don't tell them they are free. Tell them Satan is after them so that they will keep coming. This thing you preach, they will not come again. He was angry. I said, don't talk to me like that because first of all, I senior you both in ministry and in life. I asked you before I came. You say you know what I'm preaching. And I came to preach what I'm preaching. Now if you're not happy, I'm ready to go back. You say, yes, I think you should go back. I was to preach three days. The next morning, they took me to the airport. I boarded my flight and I came back to Nigeria. Now down the road, after a few years, some of his members, their eyes opened to this message. Very sadly, that church is no more in existence. Shut down. The pastor is even no more in ministry. How does it make you feel? Very sad. Very sad. If you had listened to me and had calmed down and had sat down, let's look at the scriptures together. I could have helped him. But he shut down to the grace of God. Do you see churches in, in Nigeria shutting down like that? Well, my prayer is that they don't shut down. My prayer is that a transformation happens. Even in those that are not where the gospel is preached. My prayer is that a transformation will happen to the pastors so that the people can be salvaged and helped and so that those churches will continue because there's no one church that can do it. We need more pastors. We need more churches. The world is too big but not in falsehood. So my prayer is that those churches, a transformation will happen. A transitioning will happen just like it happened to me so that the gospel of Christ will be heralded on all pulpits all over the world. Your children, I know there are so many pastors who follow you. You are their father. What can you say about their followership today because of the messages you preach? Some of them left, but the people following me today are a thousand times more. And I'm talking about pastors all over the world than the ones that followed me before. The eyes of pastors are opening in America, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, all over Africa, all over Africa, Mr. Mana, Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Zambia, Namibia, Ghana, I mean, all over Africa. Pastors are waking up to see the truth of the, because a lot of pastors are genuine in their service of God. It's just that somebody didn't show them the truth. And now that when they hear the truth, their hearts, their spirit bears witness. And some of them reach out. Some of them call. My mentoring academy is packed. And we're taking a lot of pastors through teaching, through transitioning, and we're making them to see the gospel and to understand the scriptures. A revolution is imminent in Africa and around the world with the gospel of Christ. So can I say that you are undertaking a revolutionary uh, activity in the Christian world? Well, people call it that. But what I see myself doing is I'm just bringing enlightenment and helping people to see what the truth of the scriptures are so that our worship of God can be solid. Our worship of God can be as it is according to the written word of God in spirit and in truth. You can also say this is the one man that has spoke. Well, like I said to some people, I'm not the only one preaching it. It's just that my voice is loud. You championed it. Yes, you my voice is loud. But there are many people preaching it quietly that eventually their voices will come out. And everybody will know it's not a one-man team. It's our team. And we will do it together. What are your fears in the days ahead? I have no fears. I only have joys and excitement that the gospel of Christ is thriving and that the word of God is growing mightily and it will continue to prevail. Okay, so since you started preaching this gospel, this message, this line of messages, can you take your mind back to one experience you've had that has given you so much joy that, yes, I have entered the right path? Many, many, many experiences. People bring in testimonies. I was in church for 30 years, and I never knew Christ. I was in church for 20 years. We left church, but now hearing what I'm hearing, I want to go back to God. I'm an atheist. Christianity never made sense. I even thought there was no God. But hearing what I'm hearing, I want to receive Christ. I'm having all those testimonies across the board. In fact, there's a podcast I did last week. If you go to the comment section, the testimonies are overwhelming. All over the place. The testimonies are overwhelming in thousands of what God is doing all over the nations. That gives me fulfillment. That's my motivation. That lives are changing. Lives are being transformed. Christ is taking his people back to himself and people are having an active relationship with God Almighty. Okay, so if you were to meet with somebody like um, 
Pastor Kumui, somebody like Adeboye, somebody like, um, um, what's his name in Kodakot, Salvation Ministries, Ibiomye. If you were to meet with these great men of God, one on one, what would you tell them? I will relate to them joyfully, I will greet them nicely and appreciate what they do. And if they ask questions, I will answer. What will you tell them about what they are doing and what they are doing? I'm not the judge. I'm not the judge. Christ is the judge. But I'm doing what I know is the truth in the scriptures. Because the scriptures remain the only valid manual for the practice of Christianity. If it is not in the scriptures, it is a scam. It must be found in the scriptures. Is it true that you've been threatened because you're preaching this? Even online, you see videos. Damina will kill you. Damina, if you come to South Africa, you will die. Damina, all over the place. And I keep saying, when I was preaching that gospel, I was the darling of everybody. I was all over the place. Everybody wanted me. The moment I started preaching Christ, I'm being persecuted. The more reason why I know I'm on the right track. Because Jesus said, beware if everybody speak well of you. If you're on the right track, they will attack you. They will do what they did to me. Now, so I'm seeing videos online. I'm seeing people insulting me. I'm seeing people accusing me of pregnancy of people's wives. I'm seeing people saying all kinds of things. They never said that before when I was preaching that gospel. But now they are saying it because I'm preaching this gospel. So that already validates the fact that I'm on the right track. Persecution is one of the marks. Okay, let's talk about water baptism. Okay. Where do you stand? Where does the Bible stand? Not where I stand. Where I stand is irrelevant. Because what does the do not do water baptism. So what does the Bible teach about water baptism? What's the origin of water baptism? John. Why was John asked to baptize people? In John chapter 1 verse 29 to 32, John said Jesus was his cousin, but he didn't know him. He didn't know him in the sense that he was Jesus, the Savior. But he knew him as a cousin. Then he said, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Am I come baptizing? For he that sent me to baptize said, Upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending like a dove. That is he. So the essence of water baptism was to identify the Christ. And then John placed a disclaimer on the water baptism. He said, I indeed, John, I baptize with water. But the greater than I shall not use water. He shall baptize with the Holy Ghost. He says, I, I must decrease, he will increase. So today, John is gone. The purpose of his water baptism has been accomplished. He has identified Christ. So our eyes are off John, our eyes on Christ. And John told us, Christ will not baptize with water. He will baptize with the Holy Ghost. So today, when you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Ghost. That's the only baptism. No water. That's what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5 says. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Not two. If they baptize you in water and you receive the Spirit of God, that's two baptism. But the Bible tells us it's only one. And it is a baptism of the Spirit. So that is also a scam. Yeah, what about baptism? Well, it's not a scam. It's just, mis it's just a lack of understanding. It's ignorance. Actually, for me, it's swimming exercise. Swimming exercise. Yes, that's what they're doing. Because it has no spiritual value. If water baptism was a necessity, the thief on the cross, Jesus would have told him, go down and be baptized first. But Jesus told him, today, you'll be with me in paradise. When Paul was speaking about his ministry, he said, I don't know if I baptize anybody, but I just remember one family I baptized. For Christ sent me not to baptize with water, lest the cross should be of none effect. In the book of 1 Corinthians. So Paul placed a disclaimer on water baptism also. So again, that shows you that water baptism, the purpose of it was to identify Christ, and it's long gone. Today we have the baptism of the Spirit of God, which guarantees us eternal life. So is Holy Communion also a scam? Well, Holy Communion, it's a misunderstanding. Because first of all, in the Bible, there is nothing like Holy Communion. It's not there from Genesis. Breaking of bread. Breaking of bread is love feast. It's love feast. That's the meaning of breaking of bread in Acts. That is, you bring food, I bring food, he brings food, we sit down. I eat your food, you eat my food. Love feast. That's the meaning of breaking of bread. That's what they did in the book of Acts. Yeah, but the Bible also, uh, Bible also talks about sharing in the body of Christ, which is the bread. 
and shedding of the blood, which is um, uh, the wine. So again, so in biblical concepts, you stay within context. You can't cross carpet. So when you're talk, talking of breaking of bread, it's love feast. When he's talking about my body broken for you, it's not holy communion. The Bible calls it Passover. So that's why there's no holy communion in the Bible. Holy communion is the rebranded Passover, which was a feast of Jewish people that Moses gave them to put their mind on what Christ will do. And that's why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So our Passover today is not something we eat and drink. Christ is our Passover today. How do we drink and eat Christ? Through teaching. When the word of God is taught and you are hearing it, you are partaking in the communion of the Lord. Now in 1 Corinthians, now before I go to 1 Corinthians, in the book of Luke, where Jesus met the disciples and on the Mount of Olives, they broke bread and, and, and drank wine, and he said, I will no longer do this with you until that day in my Father's kingdom. Jesus rises from the dead. They didn't sit down to eat bread and wine. But Jesus said, I will do it in that day. He said what he did was to teach for 40 days. So which means it was symbolic of the message of Christ after resurrection. Now if you come to Corinthians, where people are always quoting, but brother Paul says, he says, in that day I receive of the Lord Jesus. How that in that night which he was betrayed, in 1 Corinthians 11, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. He you took wine. He took wine. And he drank and he says, this is my blood of the new covenant. And as often as you do this, you show the Lord's death till he comes. Paul was making a reference. That whole context is a reference from the book of Luke. And what Paul was teaching in the pretext was the Lord's Supper. He said, you say you come for the Lord's Supper. Now, supper is evening food like dinner. And he was indicting the church at Corinth. That you people say every time you gather to take the Lord's Supper. But when you come, those who have, they eat their food and not consider those who don't have. And after eating, those that are hungry go home hungry. Those that are having will go home full. He said, this is not the Lord's Supper. He was rebuking a church for not walking in love. Then he brought the parable of that Passover. He said, for I receive of the Lord Jesus that in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And he said, this is my body. As often as you eat, you show the Lord's death till he comes. I said, but because you do not discern the body of the Lord. The body of the Lord is me and you. We are not discerning each other. He said, for this cause, some of you are sick, some are weak, and some die. What he was saying is, because we are not working in love in the church. Somebody is sick. All he needs is 2,000 naira to pay hospital bill. Nobody considered him. Nobody thought of him. And because of that lack, he died in the hospital. Somebody is weak in the church. All he needs is some vitamins, but he can't afford it. Because nobody is sensitive to the need of the brother. The brother is having sickness and is constantly weak. So Paul was rebuking them for their insensitivity to the love work using the parable of the body and the blood of Jesus, which was broken for all of us. That is to say, if we're really working in love, we should look after each other and care after each other. That's what Paul was teaching in 1 Corinthians 11. Not eating elements. Uh -uh. Because in chapter 10, he already told us that we are the body, me and you. We are the bread. We are the bread of the Lord, we, me and you. So if we are that bread, then we are not eating any bread anymore from the bakery. Because in Colossians chapter 2, Paul said, Let no man judge you in drink and in meat. And he says, Which are all to perish with the using. He said, And because you have made too much importance out of things you will eat and go to the toilet and push out, he said, You are suffering from kwashoko because you are not nourished. You are not holding Christ. So instead of holding Christ, people are holding bread and wine. And bread and wine, once you eat it, it goes to the toilet. But what you should be holding is Christ, which was symbolized by the bread and wine. Paul was not endorsing a practice of eating something. He was rather bringing out the message in the broken body and the blood of Jesus, which brings into us a love walk where we look after each other, we love each other, and we help each other to serve the purpose of God. I have a book on it. 
is called the, com the, law, the communion table. It's about 450 pages. Because this whole thing I'm teaching in a jiffy now requires hours of exegesis. We have to start from Exodus, studying the Passover, looking at how the feast was done, what was the feast for, and travel with it right into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then come into the book of Acts and explain it well. Then come to the epistles and finally settle the matter. That it was not a practice of the New Testament church. Rather, it was a parable that was used to bring out the message of Christ for the believers. Oh, well, it looks like um, you must have been doing some maybe weeks, months of fasting to get these revelations, to get these insights, studying so much. What, what can you say? What was the highest level of fasting you have uh, undertaken to be able to have all of this? You don't need fasting to, under, to, to have this. You don't need fasting. You don't need fasting. You just need to be hungry for the knowledge of God's word. Sit down with your Bible by the help of the Holy Spirit. Study. And then have a good pastor or a good teacher to help show you the principles of interpreting scripture. And just stay there for, it takes time, it takes hours, it takes hours and hours of study. But if you're hungry for it, Jesus said, if you seek, you will find. You will What's come the longest to number of hours you spend studying? Days. And I don't like saying so people don't think I'm bragging. But there are times I'm on my study table for two days, non-stop. How? I just sit there and I keep studying. Non-stop. You don't go to eat? They bring snacks for me on the table, maybe a little drink, a little fruit, a little rice here and there, but I'm just there studying through the night. In fact, there was a time we went to, to Ghana, Takoradi, to preach. So when we came back from the service, I just felt an excitement in my spirit, and I just wanted to study that night. Mr. Mana was studying till the next morning. Pastor Philemon came to my room around 8 o'clock and saw me studying. Ah, sir, didn't you sleep? I said, no, I didn't sleep. What's the time? He said, 8. I said, oh, get me tea. He brought. I drank. I continued till 4 p.m. Till 4 p.m. When I stood up to shower, get ready, go and preach. And Pastor Philemon was like, you didn't sleep the whole of last night till this afternoon. I said, yes, because the, when you begin to enjoy the study of God's word, you get into what I call rapturable moments where you, you lose consciousness of time. And time flies. And it happens to me many, many times. Even in my house. There are times mama will come to me and say, Ah, ah, rest a bit now. You've been studying since yesterday. Take a break. And I'm giving to studying because, not to prove a point, but because I enjoy it. And the more I study, the more I'm happy because I'm discovering more of Christ and more of what he has done and more of his power, which I am able to use now to build people all over the world. To work in the realities of Christ. Are there people you have built that you are confidently, you are very, very sure that they are going to take after you? Thousands, millions all over the world. I mean, in every nation. I have sons and power city is not just Uyo now, it's in every country. And we have several power cities in many countries. I have pastors in all of these countries. And in fact, almost everybody in our congregation is a pastor because our church is a Bible school. We just teach, 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 answer questions, teach, answer questions. So within a short while, you see people who just came in a few months ago are already teaching the word of God. And there's that massive generation of people rising all over the world. And you don't perform miracles? I perform miracles, but I don't show miracles. I'm not a showman. We pray for the sick, they get healed. We pray for people that are going through things and God does miracles. I'm telling you, it's happening. Cancers, I mean, all kinds of things. But we are not showing. We are, it's not about show. They it's don't about, carry crutches to, to showcase. No, we don't do that. We don't display things. <laughs> Our message is what we show. What Christ has done and what Christ is, who Christ is and what he has obtained for us. And then, of course, when you teach it, God will confirm it with signs and wonders. But we don't display the signs because you can have miracles and people are not born again. Moses did miracles for 40 years. Nobody believed. So miracles are not ultimate. What is ultimate is the message. Like I keep saying, if miracles were the ultimate, then there would be no need for the message. But people experienced miracles under Jesus' ministry and they didn't even believe the gospel. But what is ultimate is the gospel. Lazarus was raised from the dead after four days. Where is Lazarus today? He still died. 
of the greatest of miracles of physical healing and prosperity. People can get it now. It's temporary. People still die. Even if they're healed of cancer, after a few years down the road, they still die. But there's something you can never lose, and that's eternal life. And eternal life comes by the gospel. And that's why our emphasis is salvation, eternity with God, a relationship with God, which is eternal, which you will never lose. That's our focus. All right. Thank you so very much, sir. It's, um, it's been a very wonderful session with you. Mr. Man, I know dull <laughs> moment with you. <laughs> <laughs> We've not done this for a very long time. I agree. I'm, I'm happy that we're here again. I'm happy you were able to make Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank so you for coming. So, viewers, um, that's how it's been. Uh, there's no dull moment with Dr. Ebert Damina. He's causing problems everywhere in the globe. The internet is packing and... Um, uh, it's always a delight having to talk with him. I'm sure there will be a lot more time that we'll need to share uh, stuff with him. Uh, so, until we come your way again, my name is Ofonime Omana. I'd like you to keep watching Russian TV. Try as much as possible to subscribe to our channel, like all the things we share. That's how you get to know more about what Dr. Eber Damina and others are doing. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mana. You. Thank you so much for you, for, for coming. And uh, I'm not a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> this is a production of Goshen TV.